I'll I'll do a really brief intro to the three of you and then you can introduce yourselves further and then take it where where you like and I'll just do sort of <laughs> when it's time to sort of wrap it um up. So we have got the wonderful Jo Alsop, uh, who um does many things, but uh, the one I know her most for is the heating hub. And um Jo ran this whole campaign around Lower the Flow, which was a mind blowing moment for me when I realised that all of the boilers that we're running currently that are gas based are all running really inefficiently and um we just need to like turn a little dial and we save carbon and we save money and we make ourselves more comfortable and what are we doing that we're not already doing this um so she's doing great work in there and she'll tell you more about that and all of the other work that she does and then we have Abid Zuhag from Built Environment Smart Transformation and Abid is in the retrofit team there and does all sorts of stuff in actual skills training like doing the thing that we're all talking about, which is just brilliant. And he can tell you more about the exciting stuff that happens up there. For any of you who might have been aware, it was Construction Scotland Innovation Centre until a couple of months ago. And then I think, and I've joined them as well, so I'm a little bit like uh, biased, but it's the most exciting place because they're doing such great things. They're delivering all this training and so much of it is free at the point of access. So picking up on what Paul had said earlier on about there being a generosity of spirit in this space, there really is. And um, and there are sort of more institutional organisations who are getting knee deep in that space to also say, yeah, look, if we're going to be serious about accelerating this, then we need to take away as many barriers as we can. And like, let's be honest, a paywall is a big, a big barrier that we need to remove. And then we have David Nugent um, from Canopy Housing. And I think I just feel like David has a lot to talk about in lots of different spheres, because last night we were talking about how you were at some other like beautiful old house talking about entirely different things and you had to completely switch your mind to where you were going to be today and so I'm going to let you introduce yourselves but um, can we have a little hand for our skills panel our last panel before lunch thank you, thank you. so I, th I think we got as far as agreeing we're going to give a sort of five or six minute presentation to start with and then see where it goes um, and forgive me I do have to work from notes I feel like I always have a lot to deliver in terms of content and um, I don't want to drift from it. So um, my background is I'm a charter surveyor um, I run the heating hub and we provide impartial and expert advice to households to decarbonise their homes. Um, our particular focus, as, as Sarah said, is, is, is looking at existing gas boiler efficiency and, and road mapping households to a, a low carbon heating system where they're perhaps not ready to move to a heat pump straight away. We also re review multiple um, technologies. Um, I think Chris mentioned earlier, people come with quite insane ideas about what they think they need. And it's, it's sort of stripping back and find a sensible approach, but also that bird's eye view of impartiality. What, what is right here um, and before engaging suppliers? Um, and all that advice can be converted into action. So I think there's, there's always a barrier around um, fight, getting the good advice, but then who do you find to do it and trust to do it to the standard that you want? So we've sort of created that next step within our business. 50% um, of our business is really maintaining a network of installers that are really um, uh, technically competent. And it grew out of a heating installation business that I ran with my ex-husband. Um, didn't think I'd find myself in boilers necessarily, but I, I ran that with my husband. And one of the most successful things about it, I, I mean, I enjoy writing, was uh, the website. I used to blog about um, boilers and heating, and I guess there was a void for you know, good information. Um, so it, it got very popular. We were just a local business. Um, we were suddenly getting this national audience of, of people coming to us um, and looking on the website. So a very, very short story, a long story short, is um, that we decided to set up a, a standalone business, or, or I did. Oh, I'm just... Uh, sorry. Uh, so concurrently to that, I was um, carrying on researching, and, uh, and I continued to research and blog, and this led to some Twitter conversations, and that led to some training, and, um, and, and the discovery that condensing gas boilers massively underperform on their, on their A-rated label efficiency. Um, and that's entirely hidden from everyone, including 99% of, of gas in installers. I took this back to my business partner, Caroline, and it was really our sort of joint sense of indignation and injustice um, that drove us to set up a business that provides customers with impartial advice that they can they can action. Um, as it was clear to us that households and the planet are long standing victims of a self serving industry, um, and this was long before the cost of living crisis kind of got thrown into the mix. 
So I, I actually want to use the, the majority of my um, my sort of introduction just to set out the context of, of condensing gas boilers and where they failed, as it's almost always news <laughs> to everybody I speak to. Um, so heating accounts for about 31% of household uh, emissions and a fifth of uh, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. So it affects both our health and the planet. And so we have to decarbonise heat, we know that. And we can do that by changing to a heat pump or another low carbon heat source. Um, we can do it through demand reductions, retrofit, we've talked about here. Um, but the less talked about we can do through reducing energy waste. And what I mean by energy waste is, is condensing gas boilers are, um, are A-rated boilers. Uh, they've been mandatory for 17 years. We've probably all got one, um, but they're not A-rated out of the box. They actually have a variable efficiency. And studies have found most to be C to E-rated in the home. And what that means is that they're 75 to 85% efficient instead of the 92 to 94% efficient that we expect and that we've promised. So this is a, a direct result of, of five factors that I've kind of fathomed out. Uh, an underinvestment in the workforce. So it means gas, gas engineers have not had the training, they've not been able to transition in skills and knowledge from non-condensing boilers to condensing boilers. Um, they don't understand the requirements of the technology, they oversize the boiler, they don't commission for efficiency, and they don't know how to set up advanced heating controls. The second is uh, lacklustre building regulation. So despite 17 years and knowing the failures pretty early on, um, they've, they've uh, failed to correct the market failures by tightening up regulations. The third is a, is a hidden efficiency. As householders, we don't know how inefficiently our boilers are running. It doesn't tell us. Um, and, uh, and we don't know that it has a variable efficiency either. We think they're just A-rated, the same as our fridge, the same as our washing machine. So how do we got a digital display on the front of our boiler that says, I'm running at 75%, um, then we'd have pushed back much sooner on installers, on manufacturers, um, that they're not performing as, as sold and as promised. The fourth is that gas has been cheap, 2.5p or less per kilowatt hour for, for many, uh, a very long time, and this has masked inefficiency. And it, there's been a real inertia around um, uh, any performance shortfall messages getting through to, to households. And finally, the, the get out of jail free card for manufacturers is that gas boilers still work, even when they're set up really badly. Um, yeah. Uh, so instead of the market attempting to correct these failures over the course of the last 17 years, um, it's instead moved to online quotes, uh, one size fits all, next day boiler deliveries that de-skill the job, reduce the cost and drive vol uh, volume installations. Um, and it's relied on cheap gas and the margin of error uh, in, in boilers uh, to continue trading. Such is our thirst for uh, new boiler sales. We regularly swap out boilers at 10 years when they should last 22. And this means that we're replacing now A-rated boilers with another A-rated boiler that doesn't run any more efficiently. In the UK, we, we replace about 1.7 million boilers per annum, um, a figure that has risen year on year. And this expanding market is celebrated by manufacturers um, as a primary metric of their success. Now, as a result, we probably have one of the highest boiler replacement rates in Europe, uh, where the same boilers uh, that we have here last twice as long. And if our replacement rates were in line with Germany, um, I've calculated that we would fit 438,000 fewer boilers per annum. Uh, so there's a, there's a sense across the industry that we've already kind of turned our back on, on fossil fuel uh, heating and maybe amongst households as well. Um, as we looked, as they certainly look to the next volume product, which will be heat pumps, as they have an opportunity then to sell another product into our homes all over again. And, and, and in doing so, though, we risk um, sweeping under the carpet the, the, the market failures in delivery. And we spend the next 13 years until they're banned, uh, replacing our boilers um, and wasting lots of gas in the same way. So in our business, we advocate uh, a different approach. So rather than recoil um, in disgust from gas boilers or deny there's anything wrong, uh, we view them as a series of opportunities that we can help households get the benefit from. So the first step is to um, set up condensing gas, gas boilers correctly with the right heating controls. And so wring that 10 to 20% of untapped efficiency out of the existing boiler. And this needs to be combined with a, with a transfer of knowledge to the homeowner, but also to the installer, um, that, uh, because 99% of gas boilers you know, don't appreciate it either, that, that gas boilers are low temperature systems and they only reach their real efficiency potential when they're operating at low temperatures. Back. 
And the, and the real tragedy is really, had we been fitting them as low temperature systems for the last 17 years, had we been upsizing radiators at natural points of replacement, we would have a housing stock ready for heat pumps today. So the second opportunity with correct setup is, um, is to test the radiators for low, low temperature, low heat pump readiness. Um, with some insulation added to our housing stock over the last two decades, um, heat losses have come down. So we think that flow temperatures could come down for heating and we tend to oversize radiators based on guesswork anyway. So that, that we think there's some margin there. So if, if your house um, with the right heating temperature regime can run at 50 to 55 degree flow temperatures, Actually, it's, it's quite close to being ready for a heat pump without too much alteration. And the third opportunity is to keep that gas boiler going until the household is ready to fit a heat pump, um, even if that is five to ten years away. And so we avoid the embodied carbon of, of an interim gas boiler replacement. So in terms of who we help as a business, we try and help everybody we can. I mean, we charge for our services. Um, and so we very much, um, I guess, work with an able to pay market at this point. But there is uh, lots of guidance on our website that we offer for free uh, for every household to try and reduce their carbon emissions today with the small things, as, as Sarah said, that you can do to uh, improve your gas boil efficiency, a turn of a dial, a few buttons, um, all of which is contained in the user manual of your boiler, um, if anyone can ever find it. And um, But we try and bring that to the surface and, and roll it out in an easy to understand way. And that's me. Um, hello, my name is uh, Abed. Um, I work for Built Environment Smart Transformation, formerly known as Construction Scholar Innovation Centre in Glasgow. Um, I've recently started working there four months ago. Um, I work for the retrofit team. Um, my background was I studied architectural engineering and project management at Harry Watt University. Um, prior to that, the experiences I've had, I was part of a multidisciplinary team that um, competed in the Solar Decathlon Middle East Dubai Expo 2020, where we competed in designing and building eco-friendly homes um, and sent, shipping them out to Dubai and then they were showcased in a competition out, out over there in the Expo. So what we did was we had all our students design and build a eco-friendly home with all the solar panels and up to the passive house standards, um, airtight, well-ventilated, um, smart sensors from smart core, app core, and we used CLT panels to build a building in, in the Innovation Centre. So in the Innovation Centre, we have the only CLT press in the UK um, that where we made cross-laminated timber and the, the whole building was structured from cross-laminated timber and then that was built at the university and then we dismantled it and then it was shipped into Dubai and then it was built up in Dubai. Um, and we were one of the finalists, one of the only UK finalists that competed in that um competition so when we got when we got to dubai everyone was just amazed at how um we built a building with wood and how it was structurally stable with just sealed cross laminated timber and there was just a, they were just amazed by it in order to see wood a building made out of wood whereas in dubai it's just everything is just made out of concrete and steel um so that was my background and i've also worked in worked with grade two listed buildings trying to ref, uh, refurbish them into schools and I've seen firsthand how difficult it is working with local councils and um, the conservation officers trying to get a well-fitted building and the, you know the passive house standards approved. Um, there is a shortage of that understanding and the skill shortages in the industry that I've noticed, and especially with yesterday's panels there, that opened up my eye as well to the vast amount, the, the sheer size of what is happening with the the building stock in the UK. Um, so. With BEST, what we do is we're, we're government funded. We work with, with a lot with um, industries, um, the education sector, and we help promote innovative techniques in the industry. And we try to promote the best pra practice in the construction industry. We we have sustainable teams, uh, digital teams, where we offer VR headsets, um, digital digital technology in, in the industry, how, how VR can help in, in, in the industry, how we have the 3D scanners, we work a lot with Trimble technology. Um, uh, recently we've gone across, we get sent across uh, west of Scotland, Highlands and Islands, trying to outreach 
and showcase the, what, what we have on offer and the innovative techniques we have in the industry and try to get the education, the younger sections involved. Um, yeah. Uh, so what we did was we went out and um, went to five different schools across the west of Scotland and we had the kids getting involved in VR headsets and we would get them training on how to use cranes in VR headsets and sh um, teach them about passive houses and all the innovative techniques we have in the construction industry and get them hands on and they were just all in awe in seeing how we can implement VR and digital technology into the industry and getting them on board. Um, and so what we, and back at the factory what we do is we, with a lot regarding to retrofitting, we, we host training sessions where we upskill um, people who are facing redundancies or looking for jobs, um, all free of, free of charge funded by the Scottish Funding Council. Um, as long as you meet certain criteria, I think you've got to be over the age of 25, a Scottish res resident, and you can anyone can apply and come along to the, one of the training sessions we have at the factory. It's like a practical session where we have mobile rigs in the factory and we show them techniques of how to put, how to tape passive houses, how to apply the membranes. Um, we have contractors coming in uh, with the team from senior management level down to the contractors and subcontractors coming in working together and discussing ideas on how to come out, overcome those challenges on the, on site. Um, you see a lot of constructive criticism and dispute even when they come on uh, the practical sessions between the contractors and the designers and it all, a lot of it comes down to the design phase where you have to understand the sequences in, in fitting a passive house during the building stage because you could design it as well as you want but when it comes down to sequencing if you don't have the electrician fitting putting his wire through the wall before it's being airtight then if it comes afterwards and just drills a hole that just removes the whole purpose of it being airtight and then that creates another barrier in achieving that passive house certification. So what we do is you see them, uh, you see the little construction criticism they have between the designers and the tradesmen and it's, it's really nice to see how they overcome that and then implementing that in the design phase. We have um, a lot of the education students come in to train, we have Ministers as well that come in and get aware of what is passive house and how we're change how we're helping that in in Scotland. Also, um, yeah, so, and we also hold air tightness tests. We have like CLT rigs, all sorts of rigs, um, tin biogest rigs, any sort of sustainable methods of building. We we have rigs on that we explain how that they they can be implemented in Passive House and how that we can airtight those types of buildings. So we'll have someone coming in from RetroTech who will sh um, um, seal up a whole CLT rig that we have and show how that has been airtight, the airtightness test is shown and how that how to pass the test and how, how important it is to have prelims when building a Passive House. So before you get to the actual certification, you don't want to spend thousands on your certification and then you'd be shown the oil you had a big hole just where the electric where the wire went through so you hold those prelims tests and we'll have a smoke test where we just fill the the clt unit with smoke and then the blow the blower will blow the 50 pascals of pressure of air into the building negatively and positively and that will give you a reading and how we teach how how to take internal measurements uh, area measurements of the building and how to calculate the the airflow and the unit of air change per hour in a building and the 0.6 number you need to achieve to get a passive house certification. Um, and then we'll go on to showcase the MVHR, the mechanical heat ventilation recovery system, how that's implemented in the passive house and how important it is for a home to be breathable, not just airtight. You've got to make sure, obviously, I think it's 27 hours per change, uh, 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 changes per hour in a building. And then we go on to say how you can achieve that certification the best way possible and with retrofit we go on we, we follow the NFIT standards and we've got two training rigs where we have a cavity wall brick wall training rig and a stone mason tra uh, training rig all set up in the factory it's about three by two meters rig and um, showcasing the, the wall build-ups 
and we will showcase in, in the training we will showcase how to retrofit those buildings using um, NFIT certified products and materials using so currently we're using diaphanite thermally insulated plaster it's cork based plaster that will work similar alongside to lime plaster which allows the building to breathe obviously the most important thing in in retrofitting the building stock is breathability the the, the buildings that were built 50 or 60 70 odd years ago they, they were all based on breathable walls and we can't just completely make it airtight and then suffocate the building and then causing it more damage along the line we use products that we train people to use products that are breathable like we use wood fiber to insulate the walls directly and and so on yeah um what else do we do in the factory uh yeah along yeah that's what we do and that's all to do with the retrofit we do and i help coordinate those rigs and currently i am going through the retrofit coordination course as well um, and that's what we do yeah in the factory thank you Is this one still working? Good. Hi. Uh, I'm um, David Nugent. I'm Chief Executive at uh, Canopy Housing in Leeds. Um, I originally uh, trained as an architect but left that trade donkeys years ago, back in the 90s, and moved into housing after briefly setting up a student co-op. Um, uh, I, um, Whilst uh, in my uh, career in, in housing, I went back to uh, study at, uh, at CAT, uh, in Machuntleth and and then uh, five years ago um, uh, took over uh, at Canopy Housing. So what does Canopy do? Well, Canopy retrofit long-term uh, empty homes uh, with teams of uh, local uh, volunteers, um, one of whom is uh, usually homeless or in severe housing need, and they get to move in on the completion. Um, it takes about six months to retrofit a property. The self-helper isn't there from day one. We're not that cruel. We're not going to take somebody who's homeless and say, come and work on your house for six months. They come in the last sort of uh, three weeks or so. Um, uh, all of the properties that we retrofit, uh, we own in some way or other. So the first 50 properties that we had um, uh, were leased uh, mainly from the city council on peppercorn rents. So... Um, when they had the single regeneration budgets back in the 1990s, uh, it was like, well, this property is empty. What are you doing with it? Nobody's living in it. Can we retrofit it? And then we'll get the money back by renting it out later on to people from your housing list. Uh, so um, we did that and we did it again and we did it again and we did it again on these short sort of five year peppercorn leases. Um, it changed significantly for us about 2014, 15 when the empty homes program came out. So we had central government funding that allowed us to purchase and retrofit the properties. So we started owning properties then. That ran for a year or two. And then Leeds City Council stepped into the breach. So they recycle the money that they, that they get from selling right to buy council houses. And they now give us 30% uh, grants uh, towards the purchase and retrofit of the, of, of the properties um, that we work with. Um, our current program's based on about People in London are just going to go, what? <laughs> it's based on about £110,000 for the purchase and retrofit of a property. That doesn't go very far in Leeds anymore. It did do when we first got the funding, um, but it's all got a little bit slow through COVID, so we're, we're running the current programme a bit short and negotiating for some more money and a bigger share out of them. Um, we also get we also work with organisations like um, Land Aid, who are looking to end youth homelessness, uh, with uh, Nationwide Foundation, um, with loads and loads of supermarkets, they they they, they sort of we, um, land aid and Nationwide give us decent grants, maybe sort of fifteen thousand pound per property. We also get money from the supermarkets. So we one week we pretend we shop at Asda, the next week we pretend we shop at the Co-op. Next week, <laughs> so they, they all give us money, and that gives us about another fifteen to twenty thousand pounds towards it. The rest of it we borrow. So so, so that, that that that's um, how we do it. So practically the way that we do it and we work with the volunteers, we have um, uh, site workers, properties workers, um, that sort of first and foremost are people, people. You know, that it, it, it's, it's a lot easier to get somebody uh, who's uh, empathetic and sympathetic and can work with people and train them in the construction skills and get them to work 
in that way than it is to take somebody from a construction background and say, hey, be empathetic with everybody kind of thing, because it's just it's the people that matter in the first instance kind of thing. And they work with our volunteers. So the volunteers that we have, all sorts of different backgrounds. So as you would expect, we get young people that want to go into construction and want to know what it's like to work on a site. So they're going through basic practicalities of just being safe on there and, and, and stuff like that, and then learn how to work with the materials uh, that, that we work with. We also get a small number of people that are getting back from the construction industry. So people that have worked on a site uh, physically maybe can't do that sort of four or five days a week anymore. So they'll come along one day a week and pass on the skills that they've learned and, and, and keep an eye on people. We get what you um, might consider our local saints. So people that sort of like live locally in the area and just want to see the house at the end of the road looking good again. Uh, they want to feel good about having um, retrofit a beautiful house for a homeless person to move into. Uh, and we get people that are really skilled. We get we um, for, we, we we get quite a, we get quite a few uh, refugees by word of mouth. You know, we've, we just had a, a, a an Algerian structural engineer working on our retrofits, we've moved them on into employment, and they're laying floors for NG. It's bonkers. <laughs> it's like fully trained structural engineer. But anyway, she's happy, so that's a, so that's good. Um, so I, I think we see ourselves, whilst we are a landlord, we have to pay our mortgage after, you know, our mortgage in the end. Um, primarily, we would see ourselves as a training and volunteering organisation, uh, doing sustainable retrofit, tackling climate change and fuel poverty, acting as a bit of a social worker, employment support, all those kind of things come really before the, the, the landlord function. Um, the sort of standards we work to, well, initially when we set up in the, in the 90s, before I arrived, been there for five years kind of thing, but uh, early on it was purely just making the properties lettable. So it was like, okay, we'll repair it, we'll put a new kitchen in, we'll do whatever. Within three or four years they were starting to do sort of super insulation, so masses and masses of Kingspan on the inside and stuff like that. And then sort of I arrived with my cat training and obviously came back going, ooh, sustainable natural materials kind of thing so so we've transitioned so sort of over the last sort of uh, few years uh, we now sort of do everything with a uh, uh, wood fiber board uh, with lime plaster uh, uh, with uh, sheep's wool we're starting to use hemp as well uh, in the construction uh, so what we're doing really is trying to mainstream the use of these materials because the industry is still kind of wanting to go back to fossil fuel based product kind of thing and we're saying well look at the embodied carbon look how good this is for the actual building itself you know it's more natural to the building look how breathable it is hey housing association with all your tenants living with black mold come and see one of our properties and see what they're like kind of thing so we are trying to sort of mainstream it and so that people get used to you know cutting pieces of wood fiber board on an angle or handling lime which is a little bit caustic and things like that or trying to get well, you're not really going to get a very sharp finish with lime, but, you know, making it look nice with a nice sort of curved corner or or, or dressing the window openings with timber and things like that kind of thing to, to, to make them beautiful again. So, 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 so that's 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 the way that we that's the way that we operate. That's the sort of materials we've started working with. Um, and at the moment, the main thing we're looking to try and do, we're trying to get some money from the uh, from the energy redress scheme. Um, uh, so they recycle the um, when the energy supplies have been fined they recycle the money and turn it into in, into grants and um so we are looking to uh get some money from them to employ a retrofit coordinator we're quite folky in the way that we work kind of thing you know I, I, architecture a lot more technical than when i did it years ago kind of thing you know what i mean so we'd like to be able to document what we do a bit more clearly and we want to try and produce a, a canopy guide to retrofit that covers the people side of things the volunteering how do you work with people um, alongside um, something like the Bristolian Guide to Solid Wall Insulation, but with natural materials and stuff like that kind of thing. So that's where we aim to go. And to diversify our stock, because while retrofit's core to what we do, um, and retrofit's core to what the UK should be doing, you know, even if government built 300,000 homes a year like they always say they will and they don't, and they never do, 90% of us are going to be in the same houses in 2030. By 2050... 75% of us are still going to be in the houses that are here now, kind of thing. So retrofit's critical, but we do recognise that our Victorian terraces and back-to-backs 
and maybe not going to be that popular in 20, 30 years' time. So we're looking at sort of more innovative projects, perhaps working with heritage as well and stuff like that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's that's us about that five. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. We've got um, we've got some time for questions, but I wondered, as I was listening to all of the things that you were talking about and reflecting about your very, very different paths to the skills that you're actively working in, because you're on the ground, you're talking about like just sharing knowledge where you can and, and the, the, the work that we heard from across that. But a question for all three of you would be um, in your work around disseminating this information that you've been collecting and researching. You mentioned research a lot. You've mentioned, you know, doing all these different strands of work, trying to like land all of that. Where where would you like to see some focus or support from you know broader within the industry and and outside of that where would you like to see a bit more energy and intensity from your perspective to help get to help accelerate that i think accelerate is probably a concept you're familiar with avid given that it's accelerate to zero from from best side so you know i'll go to you joe first and then we can pass it along but where would you like to see a, a more investment just in energy terms as well not necessarily in financial terms although we know we need that too yeah oh okay um Yes, well, I think the, the acknowledgement needs to be there, first of all, that it's failed. Um, and I think that when we acknowledge that and, and when government or training organisations can acknowledge that um, gas boilers are not, in, in, in my corner of the world, um, not running uh, as efficiently as they should be and acknowledge that the, the, the shortfall um, exists within the structure of the industry in the sense that it hasn't equipped installers to go out and um, fit gas boilers as they should be or condensing gas boilers um, as they should do. Um, so that, that acknowledgement needs to come. And there's obviously a lot of self-interest and self-protection that, that are barriers there to that perhaps happening. Um, we are we do work with um, organisations um, and with and outside organisations such as Nesta now who are um, who are have a decarbonisation mission themselves um, on, around households. And um, they're very much um, putting their resource to how do we make that happen. Um, and they are also an impartial organisation. They're incredibly well financed and well resourced. And so for me, I've kind of turned turned a little bit away from the industry. I've never shut them off, but turned a little bit away to the outside help that's available. Because I don't think it's going to come within. It's going to come from without. And... Um, so my energy certainly is sort of saying, OK, you're probably not going to change, but let's go over here. Um, and, and then I think um, I think there's probably some work around uh, with with the um, cost of living crisis uh, around appealing to installers who um, and there are some training. There are some training courses out there now appealing to the sources of installers of the trusted role that they play in in um, advising households. They are really trusted but they give the wrong advice because they haven't had the training. So there's kind of appealing to them as well to sort of circle back to some training that's maybe not gas safe. It's not, you know, it's nothing to do with the safety. It's to do with the efficiency um, and, and and reaching out to them. And there are increasingly peer-to-peer -peer groups. Um, so I think there's probably some work around um, the government maybe acknowledging um, and, and then trying to roll that information out to structures that have developed themselves to support each other because that support doesn't exist outside. Um, with with best, what we what we our aim is to reach um, net zero by twenty forty five in Scotland, and we help the government try and achieve that by working collaboratively with industry and the education sector. And we do get a lot of help from the minister, Scottish minister. I think it's James Hepburn in in Glasgow that's heavily involved with us. Um, they supply us with a lot of funding and help and support where we need. Um, I think a lot of investment is needed now in the education se sector. Um, trying to train the student, uh, teach the students about retrofit and, and passive house techniques that we have. I mean, I know, you know, passive house is relatively new, it's only 30 years old now. Um, started in Germany and now we're trying to implement it into the UK. Um, however, what we do is uh, we are trying to get the outreach into the universities in Scotland. We Currently, we are supplying them with materials to host passive house practicals in the universities and train um, the students and get them aware of what retrofit is and build them up to date for the for the future careers because we know how important this will be in the future now. Um, also, we've had days where we've got backlogs of passive house practicals. Um, people are trying to book them in. We're out, running out of space. We need we need more training providers and more training centres to help achieve this retrofit target we need to achieve. Um, there's been days in the factory where we've had contractors come in the day before their build 
um, to get trained on practical, uh, to get trained on how to fit passive house um, in in the site. Um, but yeah, that's that's what's been happening in the industry. And but it's it's good they've been coming in, they've been getting the training because we have a lot of public work that's going on in Scotland where a lot of schools, hospitals are now. Uh, being designed to be passive house and they're trying to help combat that fuel poverty we have in Scotland with this Scottish government being fabulous I think getting involved and trying to achieve passive house techniques in, in a lot of the public work especially but yeah um, I think for us it'd be uh, retrofit and uh, apprenticeships and trainees I think um, uh, uh, funding those we've just taken on two of our volunteers uh, on uh, 12 month traineeships to train them up to be um uh, a full sort of properties worker and um, we can take them on at the end of that and we will definitely take one on but it would also be nice to be able to move them on to other organisations and take on two more and keep sort of keeping this process going of taking people on kind of thing so we can train people when they arrive but but and and recognising I suppose retrofit as a trade in itself kind of thing is something that can uh, that merits an apprenticeship going behind it you know plus all the other stuff, green homes, grant social housing, decarbonisation fund, all that sort of stuff that we need to actually do the retrofit and fund the retrofit of the early properties that we did just to a basic standard, really. But, yeah. Um, I've got another one for you. Um, any qu we've got five minutes or so before we break for, for lunch. Is there any questions in the audience for... Uh, yeah, we've got one down here. Oh, hello, thank you. Um, I'm just coming from a position, I'm Takir, I'm just coming from a position, um, from just an ordinary person. Um, and the first thought that would come to my mind is, if somebody came, would be, I need a new boiler. And I, I wouldn't think about, oh, I need to, you know, become more, you know, become, become more efficient, you see. Um, so, you know, I'm relying on, as you guys said, on the trust of, you know, these engineers which are coming in there, which I hope I've got more expertise than me. but also my question is slightly different is is in terms of the circular economy you're seeing a lot of for example those what happens to those old old bo bo boilers and you know should we also be looking at you know like materials and parts and things like that like the supply chain is so important as well so what can we do to make sure that we're also reusing uh, the kind of materials that we you know rather than throwing it away Thank you. That's, I mean, it's a really important part of it, isn't it? The, the circularity and in that. Does anybody want to, do you, seeing as we were talking about boilers? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the starting point for me is to repair before replace. So if you have an A-rated boiler, it has good parts availability. And, and one of the things we check actually when someone comes to us for one-to-one -one advice is we look at the heat loss and we look at parts availability on that boiler and also its efficiency potential. So I think for, for most people, as, as you so beautifully put, that you don't know there's another option. You're just trusting the word of the installer that comes around as if you know, it needs a new boiler. And, and that my boiler might be seven or ten years old. Um, so I think it, for us, it's about getting the alternative message out there that there's a viable alternative and that's keeping a boiler making it more efficient and 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 repairing it as repairs come up and that will still be cheaper than replacing three boilers over the lifespan of, of a single boiler i mean in terms of how they're broken down and scrapped i, I don't know I, I think there is a lifetime embodied carbon cost so i think if you go beyond it, it, it I, I don't i don't know much about that bit to be honest but, um uh yes i think for me it's, it's just keeping it going and until you fit a new technology I wonder just about um, talking about the circular economy and talking about using um, less of the new, less of the precious materials, but also looking at the bio-based materials. Because you mentioned, David, when you were talking about how, you know, I came back from CAT and then I was like, yeah, natural materials. And we've got lots of really great information out here about natural materials. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about how that's been received as trying to introduce those? And maybe, Abbott, you can finish then after that on how best because in the factory you've got lots of stuff around the kind of the bio-based insulation materials yeah. particularly which i think is probably a big bit when we talk about the petrochemical alternative david um yeah I mean, it's, it's received by the by, by the tenants absolutely fine i mean they're, 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 they're really happy with it lime's a lovely material and they and you know and and, and you know, in particular, the fact that all the windows are beautifully dressed in wood now, they're like, oh my God, I've got this little fancy house. So there's not a problem there. I think with our board, there was a little bit convincing because it was more costly kind of thing. And, and also the houses we work with are quite small. So, 
you know, you need a little bit of extra thickness within there kind of thing. But the market we work in, people aren't expecting monstrously big houses. They'd rather have something that's this warm and, uh, and, and, and and the fact that there's that they stay a, a little warmer as well. There's all sorts of little advantages that you get sort of like, you know, the phase shift properties in the roof that help to just retain a little bit of extra heat. And there's a little bit of capacity in there because we don't do a lot of training in the way that you use the building. We try and make it so that anyone pretty much can live in it without too much being told how to do it because we, we know that tenants are just going to fling the door open and have a cigarette at the front door for five ten minutes <laughs> do you know what I mean so we need we need something that's not going to sort of go cold sort of very very quickly kind of thing so, so so yeah I think generally they've been accepted and I think you know the people that work with them you know prefer to they're, they're nicer materials to work with generally you know bar, apart from being a bit caustic here and there but other than that they're, <laughs> they're fine <laughs> Um, yeah, in, in our factory we have, in terms of insulations and uh, circular economy, we have a, the Thermobond insulation line, which is like a five million pound piece of kit, where we can create our own insulation using recycled fabric material. Um, I think my, my colleague Sam Patterson, he's more, um, he hosts the training sessions and in insulation, he knows a lot more about insulation than me, he can just go on and on for days, but what, what I've seen is... Um, we have a line of insulation, types of insulations that's used in the industry. Um, we try to promote using wood fibre a lot, um, locally sourced materials in, in the factory as well. We, we only try to source materials from Scotland, a lot of Scottish um, larch. We use spru local spruce wood. Um, we're trying to achieve that net zero standard and the sustainability element in, in, in the industry by having a lot of circular products. And especially with insulation, we've mentioned you train how people to cut, cut insulation into boards and tight angles and that's what we do in a lot of particles how to minimize wastage and in, in, uh, insulating buildings and getting that two millimeter tolerance uh cutting it into the wood buttons and the fittings which can be really difficult and how how that is achieved in building sites obviously we're just training in a little one meter by one meter product but obviously when you're on site you you build your building homes a huge scale on a huge scale and imagine the con um tradesmen fitting those in into those large panels and large buildings um but yeah i think that's what we're doing in the factory I think. thanks so much i think um in conclusion i think what's been interesting is hearing you know reflecting on yesterday the big ideas and 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 the sort of con the context of the whole situation right then bringing that through this morning and then landing up here talking about mitre cutting insulation and degree turns on a boiler and all the complexities that go within that and it gets a bit like oh god there's so much to learn and so much to do but i think the diversity of the work that you're all doing sort of is heartening as well in that in that you're doing all this work in that space and there's other people that we know about and, and you're doing all that work and that's spinning out and that's spinning out. And and it's and it's great to 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 see that that's all out there happening and that there's all these conversations, conversations about the bit that comes, you know, the questions that come back in to see that you're thinking about those. But the one thing that you all talked about was trust as well. And 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 talking about the occupants, you've all talked about the people, the environments that you're creating to live, not the products that you're you know, dealing with or the contracts that you're signing, but the the care of the occupant and the environments that for 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 them, for us, right? So I think that's really also brilliant, and I hope that that's a reflection of how this industry is going to move in that by keeping the people at the centre of of their the work and the creation of this retrofit revolution. Um, on that note, shall we have a break and have some lunch? and reinvigorate ourselves um, for some closing speeches and some other little bits and pieces of panels after lunch. So you can come back here at two o'clock and you can go down to the uh, Straw Bale Theatre at two o'clock and you can just mosey around until then, get some lunch over towards the, the red shed and the toilets are over there and um, yeah, and recharge and we'll see you back at two o'clock. Thank you everybody.